just what is string theory? What are these strings? Uh, string theory is an attempt to make sense about all the phenomena we see in nature in terms of one unified field theory. So 20th century physics basically understood reality, or as much as we know of reality, in terms of two big theories. It unites the quantum mechanics that describes the atoms and molecules with general relativity, which describes stars, planets, and galaxies. And of course, we have to unite them somehow, because the stars, galaxies, and the planets are ultimately made out of atoms. So it wouldn't make sense to have one theory that only works for atoms, while another theory entirely would be used for stars and galaxies. They're all made out of the same stuff, so they have to be described by the same theory. How did we get from the atom to the string? Before string theory, there were elementary particles, lots of them, electrons, muons, and quarks. And to just try to convey the idea, I'll just draw a little dot, which is meant to symbolize a point particle. And as I said, there are lots of them, electrons, muons, some of them better known to the public, some less. Like maybe you haven't heard of tails, but in my line of work, they're important beasts. Now in string theory, instead of a point particle, you've got a loop of string. But it can vibrate in many different ways. This is one shape it can have. It could be more like a circle, or it could look wavy. And the different shapes the string can take, according to string theory, are the reason that there are so many different kinds of particles. The different particles are just different ways a string could vibrate. But let's just imagine it from the point of view of someone who maybe isn't a physicist but appreciates music. So where does the beauty of music come from? Well, a violin string or a piano string can vibrate in many different ways, just like one of these. And in that case, the different kinds of vibration are associated with what we call the different harmonics, or higher overtones. If you had only the pure tone, that would be the sound made by a tuning fork. And you know, to the human ear, it sounds very harsh. The beauty of music comes from the higher harmonics, which give music its richness, and which are the reason that we've got both violins and pianos. So just like the beauty of music, so the richness of the string comes from the fact that the string can vibrate in many different ways, leading to all the different particles and forces that we see in the universe. In fact, that's also the way we would combine the quantum world, which involves all these particles, with gravity, which from this point of view, Einstein's theory involves one more particle, which is the graviton, or the basic unit of Einstein's gravitational waves. So the, these vibrations of these strings can unite the two clashes that we have between quantum mechanics and gravity? If this theory actually pans out, then the way it works is that the graviton and all these other particles, which we see in the subatomic world, come from different ways that the string could be vibrating. Now, you say you say interest, something interesting, if it pans out. Yes. Is that a big if? Well, it's, of course, a big if, because like anything else in science, it isn't in the bag until it's actually in the bag. Well, when's it going to be in the bag? Well. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's a bag of tricks. Right? Right. When is it going to be well, real, you know? I don't know, concrete? of course, about the future, but it's interesting to look back at the past, because the trail started in the late 60s, when the first glimmerings of string theory appeared in efforts that physicists were making to understand the strong interactions among protons and neutrons. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long trail of discovery since then, full of surprises. And in each decade, we've learned that the way we understood the theory a decade before was very naive. Then physicists stumbled onto this new framework, where there were a lot less theories that were possible, and they all involved gravity. So instead of general relativity being impossible in the standard framework, it was necessary in this new framework. And that's, that's a good proof, then. Well, that's, that's a very good encouragement, encouragement. that it's on the right track. Yeah. And it certainly was the single most important thing in getting me excited. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's great to have a theory that forces you to have gravity instead of the old framework where gravity was impossible. And weren't there five possible theories for string theory? The traditional viewpoint back in the 80s was that there were five possible string theories, which was a big improvement over physics as it had been before. Because in the standard quantum mechanical framework, there are all kinds of theories you could have, in fact, infinitely many of them. What we learned in the 90s was that the different string theories, as we'd known them traditionally, were actually different aspects of one bigger theory. It's a little bit as if one string theory described the tusk of the elephant, one described the tail, one described the elephant's ears, and another described the trunk. And then finally in the 90s, we learned that what we've been studying from different points of view were different aspects of one elephant. It's a very dimly lit elephant. We don't understand it very well. But at least by now, we know that there's just one elephant, one candidate for super unification of laws of nature, which we've been studying from different points of view for so long. So there's a picture that's often drawn to illustrate this, where the different string theories that existed traditionally 
are the corners of this plot. I'm actually drawing six corners. There were five string theories. One of them is the heterotic string, heterotic E8 times E8, technically. And then there are the other string theories. I won't bother with their names. And there was a wild card that entered this mix that isn't really a string theory. But what we now understand is that there's this one elephant, this one theory, M theory, which we don't understand too well, but it's our candidate for superunification. And the different string theories, as we had them traditionally, are different limiting cases of this one richer and still mysterious theory. Why call it the M theory? Uh, if we really knew what it was, we'd give it a better name that described it better. But since we don't really know what it is, we give it a temporary name like M theory. I always say that M stands for magic, mystery, or matrix, according to taste. Magic and mystery are clear enough, and matrix is a mathematical ingredient that's used in describing the theory. What kinds of experiments or uh, how do we look for these strings to prove that the theory is right? What we're really hoping to find in accelerators are what are called the superpartners of the ordinary particles. Supersymmetry, which is this fascinating new concept in physics that emerged because of its importance in string theory, predicts a lot of new particles that should be discovered at accelerators mm -hmm. in the coming years. Maybe at Fermilab, if we're lucky. Fermilab is the big accelerator near Chicago, and otherwise probably in Europe at the Large Hadron Collider. Does supersymmetry tell us anything about that mysterious dark matter in our universe? Astronomers see in the universe that if you look at a galaxy, it seems to be surrounded by a cloud of invisible matter that we don't know what it is. We just call it dark matter because we don't see it. Mm -hmm. So supersymmetry makes a fascinating implication that one of these supersymmetric particles that we hope to discover in accelerators has just about the right properties so that the dark matter could very well be a cloud of these almost invisible supersymmetric particles. The idea is that this dark matter cloud envelops the whole universe, the whole galaxy, I should say, including our solar system. So they're passing through the Earth, through our houses, our bodies, all the time, for the most part not interacting because they couple so weakly to ordinary matter. Well, how would you know if you found one if you don't know what well, you're really looking for? Or do you know what you're really looking for? We know what we're looking for. They would have a big underground tank. They put it underground to shield it from ordinary cosmic rays. There are a lot of particles that come from space all the time. Some of the most important elementary particles were first discovered in cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. You'd like to shield yourself from all the conventional cosmic rays. Then you go underground, you've got this underground tank, and every now and then an atom will suddenly heat up because it's been scattered by one of these dark matter particles. So we'd like to directly observe that. And to really know what's going on, we want to produce the same dark matter particles in accelerators and study them in a controlled fashion. As someone who's been covering physics for 20 or 30 years, I'm always impressed with the obsession that physicists have in explaining the Big Bang. What was there before there was the Big Bang? So of course, we don't know an answer to this question. What was there at the beginning? Who started the clocks? It sounds like a paradox, but understanding it better is part of what we'd like to know. And if I could just give you a hint about what an answer might look like, I certainly can't do more than that. Go for it. Let's just think that nowadays uh, we don't have any trouble telling time. We just look at our watch and see that it's quarter after four. And time seems like an obvious concept. But in the 20th century, a lot of things that seemed obvious turned out, when you look more closely, they're not so precisely defined. So 100 years ago, it seemed like a particle had a definite position and velocity. But then with quantum mechanics, it turned out that that was fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And now, with more modern thinking, we can see that if we could try to combine quantum mechanics and gravity, the notion of time gets fuzzy. So this fuzziness won't really matter in everyday life, because we just don't tell time accurately enough for this slight quantum mechanical fuzziness to matter. But as you went back toward the Big Bang, the quantum mechanical fuzziness would become more and more important. I'd probably speculate that near the Big Bang, the notion of time really breaks down. And so the question of what was the beginning and what was there before the beginning, that kind of question will ultimately turn out to not quite make sense. Do you ever get impatient with this stuff? You know, you feel you're, you're aging, and you're getting old in age, you <laughs> watch your kids go to college, that sort of stuff. Someone's going to make a great... You know, prove your theory, make a great discovery, and you're going to not be well, there for it? Uh, I think we all have to come to grips with the fact that we probably won't see everything we'd like to see. And what would you like What would you like to see? What would you die a happy man? What, would you, what particle what would you like to see happen? Oh, I'd like to know how string theory really works. What are the concepts that improve upon Einstein's concepts by which it fits together? 
on how it applies to the real world. Is having intuition, the fact that Einstein could view a lot of the stuff in his mind without having needing the math for it, uh, is that an important thing for you too? Well, uh, we all try to see things with intuition because if you have to step through every detail of the equations, it's just too complicated. But generally speaking, none of us are as good at that as Einstein was. So Einstein made amazing leaps that were based on intuition. And honestly, I think that string theorists have made uh, a lot of nice discoveries in the last 30 years. But um, it's usually been made by working incrementally within an established framework until things fit together a little bit better, and then finally you get a better view. It's a little bit more like uh, climbing in a mountain range or hiking through mm -hmm. mountains. So you take one step after another, and finally, after one more step, you suddenly reach the top of the mountain pass, and you get a completely new view of the other side. But the last step in and of itself wasn't any more difficult or more remarkable than 10,000 steps before it. When I was a kid, I used to like to play with stuff in my basement. I used to take stuff apart, TV sets, all kinds of stuff, because I knew I was interested in science. Yes. I wanted to know how things work. Were you that kind of kid? I actually never played with electronics that much, some science kids. As a kid, I wanted to be an astronomer, and then at a later age, I thought I'd be a mathematician. And then I dabbled with a lot of things eventually. But my natural talent was in math and physics, so that's where I ended up. But you were a history major at Brandeis, right? Can't deny that one. Well, why would you want to deny that? You wouldn't really want to deny that. Uh, no, I wouldn't major. want to deny it, but uh, let's just say that for a while I was interested in history and linguistics and other things, but my natural talent really brought me back in the direction of math and physics. Is it just curiosity? I mean, you must need a lot of curiosity to, to feed yourself in this business, to feed mental energy. Well, it's curiosity, but one thing I find is that um, when I want to relax, I enjoy reading things that aren't necessarily about physics, or at least not about the kind of physics I do. But um, it's more fun for me to read things that are true than to read a novel. So I would much rather read magazines on archaeology or magazines on astronomy, even though they might be written for um, amateurs. After all, I'm a little bit of an amateur astronomer. My son and I have got a telescope. Yeah, <laughs> we go well, out and look I, at the I, skies. I'm with you. I got one also. I go, out, <laughs> go in the backyard and look at the stuff. And you know, I, you know, I. You ever look at the moons of Jupiter? Yes. And aren't you just? Don't you have? Aren't you suddenly have a mind meld with Galileo when you're doing that? I get this feeling. I know exactly the excitement that he had when he saw. It's the exciting moons. to see it, but it's hard to imagine fully how exciting it must have been to see them for the first time. Yeah. So I try to imagine it sometime, but it's hard to fully imagine. Your job is, is tough enough, I mean, having to synthesize ideas, um, and especially in a world in super string theory and string theory where there's not a lot of data yes. to go on. So what keeps you going, you know, getting out of bed and, and continuing? We don't have so many clues, but they're big clues, like the existence of gravity, the fact that string theory makes gravity inevitable, while the pre-string framework of physics actually made gravity impossible. We've got some big clues like that. Another big one has to do with hints from accelerator experiments that supersymmetry is beginning to appear. So um, we don't have a lot of little clues, but we've got a few big ones. My colleague Steve Weinberg always used to say that sometimes physicists are like elephants who eat lots of food of very low nutritional quality, and sometimes they're more like lions who only eat now and then, but their meals have a very high nutritional value. So obviously, as a string theorist, one has to work a little bit more like a lion than an elephant. But that's life. Mm -hmm. now, some people say this is so esoteric that they're doubting Thomas is out there, that this could be true. Is that, is that correct? Well, people often ask how such an ambitious theory as string theory could ever be completely tested. Maybe you could test a big piece of it by discovering supersymmetry. But string theory is even more ambitious than that. And how could you ever really experimentally probe all that? But the whole history of physics shows innumerable times when theories that looked like they'd be impossible to ever test were tested. If you go back to the 1930s, you'll see that gravitational waves, black holes, neutron stars, and even neutrinos were big ideas that all seemed practically in the category of science fiction, because nobody could imagine how any of them would ever be tested. But then, by the 60s and 70s and 80s, they in fact all were tested and some of them are now used routinely 
as ingredients in other experiments. So in many cases, they were tested because of other discoveries that were made that weren't foreseen. Other things happened. If you could foresee everything that's going to happen, science wouldn't be so exciting. Let's talk a little bit about this institution. I feel like the ghosts of the past people are here. You know, the ghosts of the great, the Einsteins, other people who have come beforehand, and that there's sort of an expectation to be a great person because you're here. Do you feel that kind of, those uh, ghosts? Well, it's best uh, to not worry about that kind of thing too much. You do the best you can, and you probably, you can't live up to some of the precedents of Einstein and some of the others who were here in the past. Mm -hmm. But you can still have fun and contribute something to science. And that's, that's great as long as you're having fun. Don't worry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fun part It's the best of, job in the world. <laughs> you get paid for doing something you love. Yep. <laughs> the only bad part is when you get stuck, which happens plenty. But How do you get yourself out of, of a rut? Is there something that you can spring no, bowling or something to get well, your mind off? If there was any one thing that always worked, of course we'd do it, and then we wouldn't have been stuck. Um, it's a little bit like asking how the scientific problems are going to be solved. So we never know that, or we would have solved them already. And then they wouldn't have been that interesting. The really interesting ones are the ones we don't know how we're going to solve, and therefore we don't know when we're going to solve them. So you try to learn something new, you talk to somebody you haven't been talking to, you read a paper you hadn't paid much attention to, you hope to get lucky. <laughs> Maybe one of your colleagues will have a good idea, and you can latch onto some secondary aspect of that. Do you worry about running out of ideas? Well, it's going to happen to all of us eventually. But we can have fun in the meantime. Why do physicists have their best ideas in their 20s? Well, uh, I would like to say that that's not entirely true. That I don't know if I'll manage to have my best ideas in, in my 50s, but I definitely did better in my 30s and 40s than in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs>